Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Come on, you guys doing good? It's great to be in church. It's great to have brothers and sisters in Christ. It's great to worship the Lord together. And it is so awesome uh, to have all of you here. We wanna give a warm welcome to all of you who are watching online, as well as our Shoreline South Campus. And uh, this past week, we had nearly 1,300 uh, inmates at our Shoreline Behind Bars campus view our services. So let's give all of these folks a great big hand clap. We love you guys so very much. All right, let's all of us stand to our feet. We're gonna do what we do every single week here. If you're new to Shoreline, uh, I just wanna uh, let you know that we read a collection of phrases that we call our Shoreline Creed. It just helps to remind us that Christianity at the end of the day is all about God's amazing, incredible love. Before we do that, I wanna let you know something that you're probably already aware of, that it takes the incredible commitment of a whole bunch of volunteers to make uh, Shoreline happen every single Sunday. And this week we were highlighting some of the uh, small group leaders, life group leaders that are a part of our uh, sisterhood. And uh, today uh, we are uh, recognizing in our second service, Diane, who, Diana, who's just a great, great addition to our, to our Shoreline sisterhood. If you'd like to be a part of using your gifts and talents to help make a difference, you can always do that at the Welcome Center after our services uh, today. We're gonna share our Shoreline Creed together. If you're new to Shoreline, just read along. The rest of us, we say this with some enthusiasm and passion. You guys ready? ready. Here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give God praise for that. All right, you may be seated. Every once in a while, I do something so crazy that Laura has to take out her phone and take a picture of it. And uh, that's what happened yesterday. Uh, and uh, I want you to you know, take a look at this uh, picture. And um, just leave it up there for a, a couple of minutes. I sent this picture to a stream of about 30 people and asked them what caption best reflects what this picture is, is showing. And, uh, and it was really interesting because every single response came back having to do with something that Laura did to me. And I didn't realize that, that our, you know, I don't know what that says about our marriage, but um, everybody thought that this was something that Laura did. Like, you know, someone said that Laura didn't want my bad breath. Well, I don't have bad breath, but that was, someone else said um, that she caught me snitching some chocolate chip cookie dough. And so she put that on my, on my lips. Another person said, this is the way Laura ends all arguments, okay? <laughs> and that's probably true, <laughs> probably true. But the truth is, is that I read an article about uh, how important it is for you to breathe through your nose and not through your mouth. And it caught my attention and I believed it enough to actually give it a try. You know, during your waking hours, you can be a little bit more conscious, but this is something I was doing right before I went to bed. I taped my mouth so that I would breathe through my nose throughout the, the evening. Okay, you could take that down. The point I'm trying to make is this. When you believe something, it will motivate some action. It'll motivate some, some doing on your part. And, 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 and that's what we're gonna talk about here today. We're gonna talk about, uh, in this collection of talks, Created to Be, uh, we're gonna focus in today um, on Created to Believe. Everyone shout out, believe. believe. Last week, we were talking about how we were created to be loved. And, and when we were focusing in on love last week, we talked about how it is core to the Christian life. Being loved by God is the absolute number one message of Christianity and everything depends upon it. If you missed that message last week, you wanna go back and get it. And we talked about how that's the reason why we say it in our creed every single Sunday. I am loved by God. We tend to forget. We, can't, we, 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 we tend to lose sight of that in the midst of all the cares and circumstances of life. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. These are the magnificent truths about God's unconditional, unending love for us. But here's the kicker. If you do not believe it, knowing about it isn't gonna do you much good. You can know it, 
You can even recite it, but the real power is in believing it, relying upon it, depending upon it, leaning into it, owning it, taking action in light of it. So I wanna talk for a couple of minutes when we talk about faith, and, and, and basically I wanna talk about the two parts to faith, the knowing part and the action part, the, the understanding part and the doing part. And you're gonna, you're gonna hear all kinds of words throughout this message, dependence and trust and believing and knowing, all of that mixes together to produce authentic faith. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I can, I can sense in my own life a, a little bit of a fluidity around my faith. It, it fluctuates. I wish it didn't. I wish that every single day my faith was strong and vibrant and powerful and it influenced my life. But I've noticed in my own life that um, if I'm not careful, sometimes my faith can wane. Sometimes my faith can can diminish and I can be stronger in faith on some days and not so strong on other days. In, in reality, I don't think that I'm much different from any one of you here today. I think all of us uh, can, can understand that reality. That's why church is so important that we come back to church and we worship God and we rekindle uh, our faith and we get filled with the spirit of God. That needs to be happening in our lives on a continual basis. Um, you know, when when, uh, when I kind of herniated my disc in my back playing golf a couple of months ago, um, you know, I, uh, I've been on this healing journey and been to lots of doctors and lots of physical therapy and trying to get, you know, my back back to where it was uh, before. And, and some days my faith is so strong and I'm just confessing uh, great things and, and I'm gonna be healed and, and my life's gonna get back to normal. I'm gonna be able to do everything that I, that I did before. And then sometimes I get a little bit whiny and I get a, a, a little bit, you know, doubtful and, and uh, Laura wants to put some tape on my lips. I recognize that about my own life and maybe you recognize it about your life as well. Well, you wouldn't be alone because when you look into the Bible, you're gonna see that all kinds of heroes of the faith had their moments where their doubts got the best of them. One of, one of the most famous stories about this is the story in the Old Testament about Elijah the prophet, and, uh, and he is engaged in a contest. And I know this is you know, going to sound kind of weird, but uh, there, there were all of the prophets of the false god Baal on one side, and then there was Elijah on the other side, and, uh, and he was taunting them, and, and he was you know, feeling you know, pretty, uh, pretty bad to the bone. You know? And uh, he said, you call down fire from, from, from your God and see if he'll uh, consume the sacrifice, and I'll do the same over here. And he said, you guys go first, and they're calling down fire, and they're praying, and they're chanting, and they're dancing, and nothing's happening. You know, the, you know, the, the, the sacrifice is, is not consumed. And, uh, and then Elijah, you know, he's feeling, you know, pretty, pretty confident and pretty bold. He says, not only am I going to call down fire from heaven, I'm going to pour water on all the logs so you'll know that there is a God in heaven. And he calls down fire and God consumes the sacrifice. Man, it was a day of victory. It was a day of, of celebration. It was a day of, of him, you know, seeing God respond to his faith and his prayers. He was on top of the world. Well, after that whole incident, there was a lady named Jezebel, and apparently she was a real piece of work. <laughs> and she says, I'm gonna kill you, Elijah. And the very next verse, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse three, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Nothing like a bad woman <laughs> to make you run for your life. But it, what's really interesting to me is that here is Elijah. He is bad to the bone in one moment, calling down fire, and then he's running for his life in the next moment. And it just reminds me that that's just like us in our human frailty. Sometimes we feel strong and we feel great faith. Sometimes that faith seems uh, diminished in our lives. And, and, uh, and Elijah wasn't the only one. 
You got Abraham, we call him the father of faith, right? God promised that he would be the father of many nations, but it took a little bit longer than he thought it should. And so he tried to become the father of many nations on his own. Then you got the story of Thomas, right? We call him Doubting Thomas, and that's not really fair because Thomas had so much faith that he left everything to follow Jesus. And then he has a moment of some doubts and he gets labeled for all of eternity as Doubting Thomas. How would you like that moment of weakness in your life to be highlighted for everyone in the entire world to see for all of eternity? It's not fair. When you get to heaven, please do not tell Thomas, oh, you're doubting Thomas. <laughs> Don't do that. Be the one church family that when we get to heaven, we celebrate his accomplishments and his faith. Because not only did he have enough faith to follow Jesus, he then had that moment of weakness where he doubted the Lord. He actually had enough faith to lay down his life and he died a martyr's death proclaiming the good news of the gospel. He's a hero. He just had a moment. He just had a moment. Just like all of us can have a moment. Think about John the Baptist. You know, Jesus said about John the Baptist that he was like the greatest person ever born. He was the forerunner of Jesus. He was sent to prepare the way. And when Jesus was gonna be baptized in the river, check this out. I mean, John the Baptist experienced something that we would all wish to experience in our own lives. He was with Jesus to baptize him. He heard a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. He had the whole Trinity operating in harmony in this moment. You would think that he would never doubt ever in his life. But a few chapters later, John the Baptist is in prison. He's a little bit discouraged about his circumstances and he sends a messenger to Jesus asking, are you really the one? I know it almost seems unthinkable, but I'm just drawing some attention to these heroes of the faith that had a moment of weakness to let you know that sometimes faith is challenging. Like the man who brought his son to Jesus, and he says, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And then you think about the, the, you know, the, the great apostle Peter. His faith was invincible at one moment. He was walking on the water and then his faith became invisible when he focused in on the winds and the waves. You know, that's, that's you, right? That's me, that's all of us. And what can help us when our faith is weak. What can we do when our faith seems diminished? I want to share with you one truth that I hope you'll, you'll write down, that I hope you'll really own today. God has given to every single person the ability to believe. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, God has appointed to each man a measure of faith. No matter how old you are, how young you are, no matter how challenging your circumstances are or how easy your life is, no matter if you're a new Christian or a mature Christian, you have all the faith you need. No matter what you're going through, you have all the faith you need. But here's the key. And this is what I want you to write down. This is, you put it in your phone, at least take away from this message, this thought with you today. I have all the faith I need, but I have to use it. I have all the faith I need, but I have to use it. I have all the faith that I need for the forgiveness of my sins, but I have to use it. I have all the faith I need for the brand new identity that I have in Christ, but I have to use it. I have all the faith I need to get to heaven, but I have to use it. I have all the faith I need to get through this marriage challenge or through these difficult circumstances, this financial pressure. I just have to use it. So, so what is biblical faith? What's biblical faith? It is one part knowing 
And the second part, doing. It's one part knowledge, and the second part is an act of our will. Knowledge is an essential part of faith. So much so that often we might say that knowledge and faith are are thought to mean the same thing. What is faith? It is knowing. It's a deep residing knowing. It's knowing that you know. It's knowing that you know that you know that you know. Where do you know that? In your knower. It's just knowing. Like you, you could say, I know that God exists. And that might be the same thing as saying, I have faith. I believe that God exists. I know that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. That's another way of saying, I believe that truth in my heart. I know that it's true. I know that God is gonna work all things out for good. That's another way of saying, I have faith for this. I believe this. I trust in this reality. But faith is not just an act of our of our understanding. It's not just an act of knowing. And James was calling attention to this, to this truth and warning us in James chapter two and verse 19 that even demons believe, they know that God exists. So it's not just enough to know. That's one part, but you gotta add the second part. The second part is an act of our will. It is personally receiving that understanding. It's knowledge that is acted upon that leads to dependence. You know that God exists. You know that he loves you. He knows, you know that he forgives you. You know that he's promised provision. That's good, but it's not faith until you receive it. You make it your own. You choose to own it. You trust in it. You depend upon it. I act on it. Because if you don't act on what you know, James is saying that kind of faith, faith without works is what? It's dead. It's ineffective. It doesn't work. We've got to know, but we also have to act. The word faith in the Greek comes from the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S being persuaded that leads to reliance. Notice you see both parts in that definition. Being persuaded that leads to reliance. Being persuaded, that's the knowledge part. Reliance, that is the receiving part. That's making it personal. That's an act of your will. And in the most famous definition of faith that you're gonna read in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse six, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, notice the two things, you must believe that he exists, right? And that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. You must believe that he exists, that's the knowledge part, and you then must also understand that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That's the doing part, that's the act of your will part, and both of those things are necessary for biblical faith, knowing and action. Because my friends, there is a huge big difference between mental assent and trusting dependence. In the Bible, the word believe and faith mean the same thing. But in our culture, we often use the word belief in a way to describe mental assent. We, we, you know, we watch the weather forecast and the weather forecaster says that you know, there's a good chance it's going to rain. And so we, we say, well, I believe it's gonna rain. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's gonna rain. I know it's gonna rain. I believe it's gonna rain. We just kind of use those words interchangeably. We're, we're coming up to football season. How many Longhorn fans do we have here? Come on, let me see your hands, Longhorn fans. All right, all you great godly people who truly love Jesus. You, you're on the right team. But you know, we're entering into this, uh, this season and, uh, and we didn't have a very good year last year. 
we lost, that was my assistant who said that's true. And she's an Aggie and she's barely saved. Just barely, she's just barely saved. So we're, we're, uh, we're, we're approaching this season and we're hoping, we're believing to win more games than we lost. But when we think about that terminology and we think about, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the football, whether you're a cowboy fan, whether you're, you know, college football, whatever the, you know, we, 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 we say that uh, we believe, uh, you know, we're trusting, um, we're hoping, we're wishing. That's it's kind of like mental assent. It's not trusting dependence. Just because you believe something may be true doesn't mean that you have biblical faith. That's what James was talking about in that verse, that even the devil believes, but it's not going to do him any good. Think about it. The devil, if you were to interview him, you could ask him, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? And he would say, yeah, I do. Do you believe that he was raised from the dead? Yeah, I saw him. Do you believe that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God? Without a doubt. We should make him a leader in the church. <laughs> he believes the right stuff. But there's a big difference between believing and trusting dependence. There's a big difference between mental assent and true biblical faith. There is. Yeah, come on, somebody. So I look at this chair, right? And, uh, and I believe that this chair will support my, my weight. I didn't do the research, but if I did and I studied the engineering, I, I might be able to tell you exactly how many pounds this chair was rated to serve. And I can know that, I can believe that, but that's still not biblical faith. It's only biblical faith if I get on the chair. Now I'm experiencing faith, trusting dependence. I'm taking action. I am sitting on this chair. I'm not just believing that it will support my weight. I'm allowing this chair to support my weight. Do you understand the connection? It's not just knowledge. It's not just a belief. It is trusting dependence. I heard a story a long time ago about, about this guy who, uh, who was a tightrope walker. He was one of those uh, people that was in the circus, uh, but he was so famous and so amazing that, uh, that he branched out on his own and, uh, and, he, and he tied a rope on the, on the New York side of the Niagara Falls and he tied it across the Niagara Falls to the Canadian side and he got up on the, on the rope and there was thousands and thousands of people gathered to see this uh, amazing tightrope walker. And he got on, on, the, on the rope and he had this you know, big pole and, and he was just walking and, and he was so confident. He was bouncing on the line and he was spinning on the line and, uh, and, and, and he walked across and walked back and everybody was in awe of his talent. And then he, and then he got a barrel and he put the barrel on the line and a wheelbarrow and it had a wheel that kind of, kind of you know, was involved with the, you know, the grooves of, of the wheel were, 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 were fitting the, the rope and he, and, he was, and he was pushing this wheelbarrow and, uh, and, and he looked down at the thousands of people and he said, how many of you think that I can walk across this line with this wheelbarrow and then get to the other side and walk back? And there was thousands of people. He said, oh yeah, we believe, we believe. You can do it, you can do it. And then he looked down at the crowd and said, all right, one of you get in the barrel. <laughs> it's one thing to believe, but then it's another thing to have trusting dependence. Now, if I was in that crowd, I probably would have said, sure, I believe. And if he said, you get in the, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it because I, I don't have enough confidence in him. I believe that he could do it, but I'm not necessarily gonna put my life on the line. And I think most reasonable people wouldn't. 
But I have a feeling that that's also what we do with God, who is infinitely capable of meeting every single need in our lives. We believe with mental assent, but we don't make the transition to trusting dependence. And it's in that action that our faith comes alive. A farmer, right? A farmer can, and can believe with all of his heart that if he plants seed in the spring, he can reap a harvest in the fall. He can believe that. He knows it to be true by experience. And maybe if he studies, he, he even has the, the, uh, the scientific reasons why that's the case. He can have knowledge. He can believe it. But unless he plants seed in the soil, that harvest is not going to come in the fall. It's believing that is matched with trusting dependence. It is an act of your will. It's action connected to your believing that makes that faith come alive. And so I can tell you here today that God loves you. I mean, he does. And, uh, and if you missed last week's message, man, I encourage you to get it because it is the core and the central theme to all of Christianity. You are loved by God, but unless you believe it with biblical faith, you lean into it, you own it, you make it your own, you act upon it, your faith is dead and that truth doesn't resonate the way God wants it to resonate and transform your life. You got to go from mental ascent to trusting dependence. And you know what's kind of interesting? When you read through the Bible, God doesn't, you know, make faith really complicated. He makes it kind of simple. And, and I know some of you might be a little bit intimidated and say, you know, my faith is not strong enough and I need to get stronger faith. I need, to have a, I need to have better faith. You know what? The Bible never emphasizes the importance of great faith. Jesus mentions it and says, this person had great faith and this person had a lack of faith or whatever. But when Jesus goes about describing faith, he does an interesting thing. He gives you the impression that really all you need is a little faith. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, he says, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing will be impossible even if you only have a mustard seed amount of faith. If nothing is impossible to you with a mustard seed amount of faith, then why would you need more than a mustard seed amount of faith if already everything is possible to you with a mustard seed amount of faith? I'm not an Aggie. But I'm just saying that makes sense. <laughs> this idea that all we need to have is even a little amount of faith. It just needs to be in the right person. It's not the greatness of our faith that matters. It's the greatness of our God that matters. And even a small amount of faith in the right person unlocks the miraculous in your life. I've seen people who have like great faith. It's just in the wrong things. I've seen people have great faith in themselves and I'm all for having, you know, confidence in yourself, you know, especially if your confidence is based on your new identity in Christ and that you are created in his image. But I've even had people who, who don't believe in God and don't believe that they're, uh, you know, created in the image of God. They just have confidence in themselves. I mean, they have great confidence. They look in the mirror and they just talk about how great they are and how today's going to be the you know, best day in their lives. And, and, uh, and, they, and they have confidence in themselves and bulldog tenacity. I've, I've, I've seen people have confidence in their faith. It's not that their faith is in God, their faith is in their faith. 
and they make the faith that they have the focus of their, uh, of their attention. I, I've seen people put faith in other people and there's nothing wrong with believing the best in people and trusting you know, that good things are gonna happen in the relationships in your life, but often we put faith in our faith and faith in ourselves and faith in others when in reality, what God's asking us to do is put our faith in him. He is the one. And, and when you have faith in God, then, then it gives you the freedom to have faith in yourself and faith in others and, 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 and have confidence and boldness in your life. Faith, the size of a mustard seed, can make everything possible in your life. A friend was going on vacation with his wife and he booked this itinerary uh, that had you know, some flights associated with it. And one of the legs of the flights was on a small, like indescribably small plane with just like a handful of seats. And when the wife you know, heard that she was gonna be flying on a jet for part of the trip and then she was gonna get on this small little plane for a part of the trip, she told her husband, uh, I, I'm not going on that plane. Uh, that plane's too small. And her husband was kind of teasing her and said, well, you know, uh, uh, you, you gotta have more faith. And, uh, and the wife said, no, you gotta get a bigger plane. <laughs> and so he changed the itinerary and got the bigger plane for that leg of the trip. And they traveled, had a great time and had peace. Because as the wife put it, she said, my faith grew as the plane grew. And I'm here to tell you, your faith will grow as your understanding of God grows. It's not the greatness of your faith that matters, it's the greatness of your God that matters. And he is big. Come on, turn to your neighbor right now and tell him God's a big God. Come on, just tell him. God is a big God. God never intended that our faith would be complicated, that it would be difficult, that it would be challenging. It's a simple thing. The grain of a mustard seed. I'm gonna ask the band to come on out and yeah, Tino, you can start playing. Give it up for Tino, Tino's awesome. Tino's a dad now. Come on. Look at that smile on that face. How, how many uh, months? Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Adorable. I don't know how she's so pretty. I know your wife. She makes up for all of them. Yeah, yeah. Faith. It's not, it's not how big your faith is, it's how big your God is. That's the key. It doesn't need to be complicated. It can be pretty simple that way. Just look up, fix your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of your faith. Recognize that it's more than just knowledge. It's more than just mental assent. It's trusting dependence. It's leaning into, it's taking action. It's planting seeds. It's sitting in the chair. It's getting in the wheelbarrow. I heard a story not too long ago about a house that was on fire and the only, the only way to get to Safety, the young boy in the house had to climb on top of the roof. Everybody else in the, in the family had made it out of the house, but the young boy was trapped on the roof. And the father saw his son on the roof and he said to his son, son, jump and I'll catch you. And the son responded and said, dad, I, I can't see you. The smoke was everywhere. The flames were so bright. The darkness overwhelming, it had paralyzed him. 
And he shouted from the roof, Dad, I can't see you. And the dad said, son, jump, I will catch you. But dad, I can't see you. And the dad shouted up, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. I can see you. You might be facing some challenging circumstances. There might be a house burning in your world and you're on top of the roof. And Jesus in his loving arms is shouting out to you, jump, I will catch you, but, but I can't see you. And Jesus would say to you this morning, but I can see you. And that makes all the difference in the world. He sees you, he knows you. And real faith is letting go and allowing God to catch you in his incredible strong arms, holding you in his promises and blessing you with the life that he has promised to give. Could I hear a good amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We're created to be, we're created to be loved. But Father, that truth is not gonna have the impact on our lives that it needs to unless we understand that we are also created to believe, to embrace that love, to trust in that love, to depend upon that love, to own that love. And Father, I pray that you would energize our faith to be more than just mental ascent here this morning, but, but to be that beautiful blending of knowledge and action of trusting dependence. Father, allow faith to rise up strong in each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's all of us stand to our feet with nobody moving around. Let's, let's sing and glorify the Lord and allow faith to resonate in our hearts and lives this morning. Just everyone remain standing with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want you to give you, I want to give you the opportunity to respond in faith to what you just heard. You know it now. Now it's that time to take that step and match an act of your will to the knowledge that you have received. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him would have everlasting life. It's the believing part, that knowledge and that faith, that trusting dependence. So if you came to church today and you're not where you need to be with God, you say, Pastor, I'm not living right. I'm not doing right. I need prayer. Maybe you made that decision at one point in time, but you slipped away. 
Or maybe you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, but you want to for the very first time. If you wanna rededicate your life to serving him or meeting for him for the first time, would you please just raise your hand as an act of faith. Say, that's me. I wanna get right with the Lord. Wonderful, hands are going up all over. All of you with your hands raised, I wanna lead you in a very simple prayer. And I'm gonna ask everyone else as a reaffirmation of your faith in God to join me in this prayer. But let's all of us pray, those with your hands raised and everyone else, let's pray sincerely from our hearts here today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. I put my trust in you. And I will live for you from this day forward, by your power, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you give them all a great big hand clap here today? If you made that decision to invite Jesus into your heart, I want to encourage you to... Uh, to uh, be seated after we uh, give our, our, our closing uh, blessing. Uh, and we have some prayer partners that would just be delighted to meet with you and give you some information that'll really help you. If you came to church and you've got a prayer request, also be seated. Our prayer partners would be delighted to pray with you. If you're watching online, uh, just let us know at prayer at shoreline.net and we'll get back in touch with you and give you all the information that you need. And we'd be honored to pray uh, for you as well. Before the, the closing uh, blessing, uh, let's let's remember next week is uh, welcome uh, our welcome back bash. We're gonna have a party. It's gonna be a celebration. We've got uh, Pat Barrett who's gonna be with us. It's gonna be a fantastic Sunday. I just wanna encourage you to invite your friends and neighbors. This will be a great Sunday to invite them to church. We're gonna have a wonderful uh, time together. And I've got a message. We're gonna continue this, uh, this talk on created to be. And, uh, and next week is gonna be uh, really, really uh, special. If you are a first time guest, don't forget uh, to grab a gift bag from the Welcome Center. Uh, we just wanna say thank you for being a part of our service here today. The blessing comes from Numbers chapter six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless.